In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. My friend, it gives me great joy to welcome you to the program In Search of the Lord's Way. You're part of a very large and growing number of people all across the nation today and in Europe and in the former Soviet Union, in Lebanon, in Israel, even in Africa who are seeing these programs and hearing these messages every week. I pray you'll be blessed as well as the others. We give thanks to God for the increased number of churches of Christ throughout America who are participating in this work also. Churches of Christ are locally independent, so when another congregation joins hands with us, it's by their own choice. That enhances our appreciation for their fellowship very much. They make it possible for you to enjoy the program without being hassled for money. And the more who participate, the wider and the stronger is our reach with the gospel of Jesus. In Gazing on Truth, Kitty Muggridge said, Self-fulfillment soon grows into a quest for self-indulgence with the vocabulary of I, me, mine. And self-indulgence, she said, in turn, soon becomes unbridled. The self-indulgent pursuit of pleasure embraces tolerance of homosexuality, addiction to eroticism, addiction to drugs and alcohol, habitual divorce, vandalism, and lawlessness, all of that sort of thing. Thus, liberty, she says, becomes libertinism. It's a dictatorship of permissiveness which enslaves its citizens, a dictatorship whose decrees are endlessly pervade by the media. Well, that gives us something to think about in today's message titled, Stay in the Lines. I'll be back for scripture reading and prayer after Ken Helterbrand leads us in a song of praise. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing, yes, I'll sing the wondrous story. The wondrous After Solomon had completed the construction of the temple, then he prayed that memorable prayer. And at the conclusion of it then, in 2 uh, Chronicles chapter 7, beginning at verse 12, the Bible says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place for myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now let us go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you for every expression of love that you have shown us in so many ways. We are thankful for the great freedom and the measure of freedom which we enjoy in this great land of ours, and we recognize you as the giver of it. We pray today that as we study this message from your word that we'll have a greater appreciation for freedom and what it means to each of us. We'd ask your blessings on us to this end. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Sing on, you joyful.
You may have seen the TV commercial that ran for several weeks in our area. It may still be running, I'm not sure. It opened with a small child coloring in a color book and a voice saying, stay in the lines. The lines are our friends. Stay in the lines. And he was staying in the lines and doing a beautiful job with his coloring until suddenly he went berserk. Started scribbling with his crayon all over the page until he just simply ruined it all. Then the video, video shifts to the automobile coming down uh, toward us between the lines of a highway. And again the voice says, stay in the lines. The lines are our friends. Stay in the lines. And he was staying in the lines. But all of a sudden, just like the child, the driver goes absolutely berserk, crosses over the lines, and in a frenzied fashion, heads for the ditch and up the other side into a field. The vehicle pitches and bounces all over the place until it's covered with mud and comes to a stop among the rocks on a hillside. The idea is break out of the lines if you like and head for the hills if that's what you want to do. There's no treatment or terrain that's too tough for our vehicle. It can take it. You just buy it and drive it and see for yourself. But there was another message that came through, a bit more subtle perhaps, but just as strong. Marketing people are skilled at capitalizing on the mood of the people to sell their products. And the current mood in America is to break out of the lines, if you like, away with all the restraints. Express your anger with the, with the system if it makes you feel better. Release your tensions. Break all the rules. Do whatever feels good to you. You have your rights. Isn't that what the American society has been doing for the past 30 years? Drop out of school, if you like. Join a gang. Rob. Rape. Shoot drugs, drink and drive. Who's to say you can't? Have sex if you like, get pregnant. Have an abortion or a baby, it's your choice. It's nobody's business what you do. Vandalize, loot, steal and kill if it makes you feel better. Even commit suicide if that's what you want to do. It's your life. Isn't that pretty much what happened in Los Angeles, Chicago? Until it's now, as Newsweek magazine said in the June 8, 1992 edition, even reluctant pluralists like Joyce Ladner say the current anarchic tendencies can't continue. Everyone I know says enough is enough. And so it is, my friend. In his book, The New Freedom, published in 1990, William A. Donahue, adjunct scholar at the Heritage Foundation says, my thesis is that the whole range of psychological and social disorders that currently plague American society are traceable to a flawed conception of freedom. Since the late 1960s, American culture has defined freedom as the abandonment of constraint. He says, and of course he's right, beginning with the Greeks, to be free meant to be free from arbitrary and comp capricious rule. It did not mean freedom from social sanctions. It meant that individuals could freely pursue their own interests, consistent always with respect for the rights of others and in deference to the general interests of society. What makes the new freedom different is its insistence on two things. One, every individual's rights to be totally liberated from all constraints, notwithstanding the interest of other people or the general interest of society, by distis distancing the individual from the norms and the values of the community. And two, moral neutrality which means that there is no such thing as good or bad or right or wrong or truth or error. These are but expressions of middle-class values, so we're told. So if it feels good, do it. May not be right for me, but if it's right for you, do it. These and other similar cl cliches pretty well sum it up. And when you push that to its limits, the inevitable end is anarchy. Plato warned that an excess of liberty 
would lead to tyranny. I don't have to tell you, you must know it already. It's now been pressed to the very brink of the destruction of our civilization. But there is such a thing as public truth and public ethic. Of course there is. A society can be established and maintained either by coercion, I mean by that, by might or power, or by consensus. Now, Americans have historically said that coercion is unacceptable, that it's a shame for any society to resort to military force to establish or maintain the order of its people. We have chosen to create our society of the people, by the people, and for the people, that is, by consensus. That means that somewhere society draws some lines on what shall be and shall not be acceptable behavior. And there are those lines again. Stay in the lines. The lines are our friends. Stay in the lines. Well, where shall we draw the lines? And on what basis shall they be established? In his book, Forbidden Fruit, which is the authorized definition of the ethics of humanism, Paul Kurtz agrees that the lines are necessary. Early in his book, on page 17, as a matter of fact, he says, every culture needs an established set of moral principles and values to live by the lines. So while we're in agreement on the need of an established set of moral principles and values by which we shall determine good and evil, acceptable and unacceptable behavior, we are disagreed on the authority for it. While we're deeply indebted to science for so much of our modern world, right and truth and values are not some of those things. These are admittedly beyond the reach of science. It is not the purpose of science to determine such things as truth and right and values. And so far as grounding our morals in human rationality, we must know by now what the Scripture said in the long ago. The way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. Man, unaided, makes a mess of things. It's a waste of time, and we don't have much of it left today, to pursue every possibility. But let's just go directly to what has been proven to be not only the best, but the only really workable standard of morality and ethics. The Ten Commandments of the Old Testament and the teachings of Jesus Christ in the New Testament are the two greatest moral documents in existence. And they formed the basis of our national ethic from the very beginning until only the past quarter century or so when we abandoned them for the new freedom. The first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me, establishes priority. And it's historically true. Psalm 33, verse 12 is, it says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. God is not only the author of nature, but of history and the source of all moral law. The second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, declares the necessity of intolerance. In the modern mind, tolerance is the paragon of virtues. But recent studies have shown that the increase in moral decay is occasioned by the increase in tolerance. That's understandable because tolerance is a retreat from commitment. The third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, is a statement of urgency and importance. It's a strike against apathy. The worst kind of profanity is lip service. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, gives faith its outward form and organization. It establishes community or institutional faith. 
And without it, faith is dead. James chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Until now, up to this commandment, the commandments have addressed man's relationship with God. But with the fifth commandment, God turns to our interpersonal relationships. And he begins with the home, the family, for it's here that we first learn about respect for and loving and living with other people. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's where you begin. The sixth commandment gives dignity and sanctity to human life. Thou shalt not kill. More accurately, thou shalt do no murder. It's wrong to murder because it is a person who is slain, and people are the offspring of God. Acts 17, 28, 29. All of us, regardless of the color of our skin, bear the image of deity. So serious is this matter that God himself declared that the violator of this commandment should pay with his own life at the hands of society. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Thou shalt not commit adultery, either by consent or by force, because it's a person who is violated in the most personal and private way. That's the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not steal, because possessions are a part of human life. His time, talent, and energy, all of which are gifts of God. Possessions represent the investment of toil and sweat and sometimes even the blood of a person. It's a sin against God to bear false witness against thy neighbor, the ninth commandment, because it's the good name, the good character, the good influence of a person who is in God's own likeness that are assassinated. God doesn't look on it lightly. The last, thou shalt not envy, because it's position or power or prestige or possession over another person who is also made in the likeness of God that's uh, sought illegitimately. Well, how could you possibly improve on a code of human behavior that's superior to that one? Well, there's only one possible way, and there's only been one person in all of history that's done it. That's Jesus Christ, who seeks to develop in the heart of the people or a social conscience for this kind of noble living. He says it isn't only wrong to commit murder, but it's wrong to hate another person who bears God's image or to be angry with him without a cause. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21, 22. Because that leads to murder. He says adultery is unacceptable because, <clears throat> but more than that even, uh, is, is to lust after a person where they're already in his heart. That's unacceptable. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 30. He gets to the heart of the matter. He wants a person to stay in the lines because he wants to stay in the lines. His thought is that a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Matthew 12, 35. His conviction is that every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Matthew 7, 18. So a person or a society must be improved and controlled from the inside outwardly. That's the Lord's way. And that's one of our purposes in these programs, to do our part in developing a social conscience based on the teachings of Jesus Christ, a Christian conscience, if you will, that will change the deplorable conditions that we discussed earlier in this program into an orderly and peaceable climate in which we can live and bring up our children and our grandchildren. We're teaching and encouraging people like you to be Christians, not only in name, but in life. If you're not already, I pray you'll accept Jesus Christ and His way today.
turning from the old way to his way in repentance and being baptized in his name for the forgiveness of your past and uh, the new life in him. Dear Father, we thank you for showing us a better way to live. Now grant us the courage as a people and as a nation to live by those principles. In the name of our Lord who taught them, we pray. Amen. There's nowhere the new freedom has made a more serious impact than in the church itself. Supposing that freedom in Christ means absolute liberation from all constraints, responsibilities, commitments, commandments, and accountability. Some voices are shouting, anything goes in faith as well as in morals. When Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 32, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And in verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Did he mean that he had erased all the lines? Or did he mean his disciples are liberated and may break all the rules, cross over all the lines and live a life of self-indulgence to do as he pleases in his worship as well as in his service and in his personal life? Are there no guidelines for faith, worship, for his church, Teaching, salvation, organization, mission, worship. What an absurdity. Jesus preceded those promises with a condition recorded in verse 31. To those Jews which believed on him, he said, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Oh, but we're not under the law, but under grace. Pardon me, please. Am I misunderstanding someone? By the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6, verse 15, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. The other day, right while I was preparing this message, from a viewer who understands uh, that in this program, we're trying our very best to make a difference in this nation and in the world, as well as in the lives of people. I received a copy of the Salisbury, North Carolina Post. In it is an Associated Press story, the headline of which says, America Needs Spirituality. That's an observation of a Presbyterian minister from Korea who 60 years after receiving his education here in America returned to receive the 1992 Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion. He says to his dismay he found a nation torn apart and no Christian influence powerful enough to do anything about it. What an indictment. We're trying to change that. Pray for God to help us and join us, will you? If you'd like a free printed copy or a cassette tape of today's program titled Stay in the Lines, simply write us in Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083. Or use our toll-free telephone number and call us. The number is 1-800-321-8633. Now, you don't have to send money. Our program and all we do is a ministry uh, of caring uh, you're carrying friends and neighbors in churches of Christ all across the nation. Tell them thanks by worshiping with a congregation near you next Sunday and join us again next week, would you? Until then, God bless you. We love you.